Away with a stellar cast anchored by Hilary Swank is an attempt to realistically project what the first mission to Mars might be like. The narrative line is gripping, and the series is very compelling to watch, definitely. But how did the show do in terms of being scientifically accurate? Hey y'all, this is Dr. Know-It-All. If you enjoy this episode, definitely make sure you hit the like button so other people can find it. And if you enjoy this, definitely subscribe for more of them. Um, also, <laughs> interestingly enough, this, I'm, at least I'm recording this on the 16th of October, which happens to be exactly the one year anniversary of the first episode. So if you want to check that out, you can kind of look back. I think YouTube is saying that I've got 93 episodes now. I, for some reason, I count 92, but whatever. Anyway, it's a lot. <laughs> so, so definitely check them out if you're interested. Also, it's very important to say here, if you have not watched the series yet and you don't like spoilers, I'm definitely going to be doing spoilers in here, so you might want to put this episode aside for a little bit, go watch the series, and come back. If you've watched the series already, or if you don't care about spoilers, guess what? They're going to Mars. Shh. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, if you don't care about that stuff, definitely stick around, so let's have a chat about it. So, super quick recap about the series. It's 10 episodes that are about an hour each. It's the story of the first crewed Mars mission, funded by the United States, Europe, Russia, India, and the Chinese government. So that's very cool in its own right, right there. <laughs> They're singing Kumbaya together. Not exactly, that's some of the stress that's going on, but it's, it's very cool and that's a nice optimistic view of the future. Five crew members who represent five different countries, and I think five different continents, set off from the Earth and then from a moon base to land on Mars. Well, a lot of, you know, sort of extra drama is added because it's a drama after all. Most particularly that Hilary Swank's character's husband has had a stroke just as she leaves for the moon and her teenage daughter is stuck sort of taking care of him and he's dealing with his own issues. The mission parameters are fairly realistic. Season one involves the journey to Mars, and, and yes, they do end up making it to Mars, so <laughs> wouldn't be it wouldn't be a really interesting show with a potential for multiple seasons if they died in space somewhere. Anyway, so that's the you know the nutshell recap of the whole thing. So let's start with the good. The good, the mission timeline seems to be about right. They don't really specify, but you know, on the order of six months travel time, something like that. Uh, there's a good attempt to do weightlessness during their travels. Um, see below with the questionable. The transport ship appears to be appropriate. It's some sort of large solar-powered entity with rotating pods for some gravity during flight. I would imagine from the rotation speed, it's a little hard to tell exactly the scale, but they're probably going for about one-third Earth normal, which makes sense because that's what Mars is. It also seems like this ship in a lot of ways is like Elon Musk's or SpaceX's Starship. Um, it, it looks a good deal like that from the outside, not in every detail, but, but there's a lot of similarities between the two. Also, they have radiation shielding in the form of a water jacket around the craft, and that actually plays into the season, into the drama of the season. And that's really cool that they have that. I appreciate that they have, uh, they think about radiation and everything. So clearly they've been consulting with astronauts and engineers about the parameters of an actual mission. So, so good on them for doing that. The crises are all pretty realistic in terms of what they are. I think they go a little over the top in terms of how many and how critical they are. And to some extent, how they deal with them, it's a little bit overdramatic. But again, it's a drama, you know. So you got to cut them a little bit of slack because otherwise it'd be pretty boring if they just sat there for six months and nothing happened. Also, one thing I found really, really cool was that they actually did the decompression, recompression times realistically. Um, most often in, you know, even realistic space shows, they will uh, immediately kind of like go out into space, right? They'll put their spacesuit helmets on and they'll decompress the airlock and they'll go out into space. You, because of the actual fact that the, the, the spacesuits themselves have lower pressure than the ambient cabin pressure, you would get the bends. So I, I think they do one hour decompressions there, which is really cool that they're doing that. So anyway, I appreciated the fact that they actually did decompression to get down to uh, zero atmospheric pressure and of course the lower pressure of their spacesuit. So, so good on them for that also. The bad. First of all, what the <laughs> are they doing on the same ship from Earth all the way to the surface of Mars and landing on the moon in the middle? That really doesn't make a lot of sense. If they're, if they're not gonna land on the moon, I mean, if they're just doing a straight shot, then yeah, that's what you do. But if they're going to this moon base anyway, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to do what they're doing. If there is a moon base, it makes a lot more sense to transfer it to a different ship and also, they 
definitely should not be landing on the lunar surface because that's another gravity well. It's just something you're going to have to fight to get off of it. I think in the sense of having some sort of dramatic thing where they're taking off again and everything, that makes some sense, but it would be so much more logical to refuel the ship in orbit and have them have some sort of tug or something that went back and forth between the two of them, a transport vehicle. So yeah, I definitely did not appreciate that. And then the fact that they were also like talking about her not being on the mission anymore and being replaced by somebody else. <laughs> it's one of those things kind of like once it starts, it seems like the ball should be rolling. So I guess effectively for the drama, what they needed was for her to be off the surface of the earth. So she had already committed to the trip but not be 100% committed so that there was this dramatic moment when her husband had a stroke and she had to make a decision about whether to continue on or not. But in terms of scientific realism, no, that definitely falls short. Another thing I found utterly baffling was this, the consideration that they would do a slingshot maneuver uh, without talking about it too much. They have serious problems on the craft. Well, actually, I'm going to get into it later, so whatever. It's a water situation, <laughs> so they may run out of water. But their, their idea is that there's another craft coming in with supplies on it, and they could slingshot around Mars, and they could meet up with this other craft. That sounds great, except for the fact that your Delta V is going to be insanely high. I mean, you're going to go like this, and at multiple times the speed of a bullet, you're going to be just passing each other. How they were supposed to slow down and actually dock with this craft, no idea, and they really don't talk about it. I thought that was a major shortcoming in the plot, and I don't know why they included it. The one way I could actually see this happening is if they happen to be, so you've got Earth and Mars, and at some point between them, there's some sort of a neutral gravity place where they're going to be at their slowest point, so it'd be the easiest to do, but that would take months to get there, so it makes no sense. It would just be faster to go ahead and land on Mars at that point anyway, so again, it just doesn't make sense what they were talking about. Also, it was very inaccurate that they were just pinning all of their hopes on landing within a few hundred meters of the supply craft. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> Everybody who's had anything to do with Mars landings realizes, yes, I know you can get closer and closer and we've got technology that's doing better and better, but you can't count on that. All sorts of things could happen, including a dust storm locally or something that could cause you to have to shift to a secondary landing point or could cause you to be multiple tens of kilometers away or something. And so it's ridiculous that they can just assume that they're gonna land that close to a supply ship. In addition, I'm not a real big fan of the whole like landing with your actual craft thing. I feel like they should have done either, they should have jettisoned a capsule, kind of like Apollo or something right off of the, um, so you've got the whole craft here, but they could have had a landing craft that would have uh, ejected from the main vehicle and then landed on its own, which would have been a much simpler process or they could have transferred to something that was waiting for them in orbit, which could have had supplies, but again, not so dramatic. Um, what they're kind of doing is more or less following the Starship's flight plans, but that, you know, number one, a lot of people think that that's absolutely nutty, what they call the suicide burn of the whole thing coming down. So yeah, I, you know, it could work, but I would have found it much more realistic, especially because the craft wasn't really the Starship and it didn't look like it was really built for atmospheric entry. And it had a lot of things sticking off of it, including pods that were rotating and stuff that they had to pull back in. Anyway, I just would have found that to be, you know, I, I, I could have bought that more if they had detached some portion of the craft as a landing vehicle or transferred to something else to land. The other thing that I found utterly ridiculous was that their supply ship was only a few weeks ahead of their main craft, their human craft, right? nobody's going to do that. <laughs> now, yes, they might send an additional craft to Mars only a little ways ahead with some like fresh supplies and like, you know, <laughs> what, some things that you could actually have that were fresh, but they would have definitely landed other craft multiple years ahead of time. So there would have been something there, some infrastructure for them to come to. NASA just wouldn't chance it that much on one single landing craft with all the supplies that they needed. So essentially those craft would have been waiting there for two years, but again, that would have removed some of the drama. So clearly what they were doing was cheating reality t for the drama. Honestly, I feel like it was dramatic enough anyway. They didn't need to add this extra stuff in, but you know, whatever. And the last thing I found really, really egregious was the very, very last picture of season one. There's a long delay and they were playing this up and that's part of the narrative and it's right. And it, you know, it's very cool that they were taking, you know, 20 minutes or whatever to transmit data back from Mars to the Earth, but you've got the people on Earth watching the landing, right? So they're delayed and they're like, oh gosh, are they gonna survive? Are they gonna survive? And then they get word that it's actually landed on Mars 
But then seconds later, they get a very pivotal picture, which is super cool, very dramatic. The fact that they're all like, you know, kumbaya, we are the world, all of us are in this picture, rather than the, just the Chinese astronaut, which pissed off the Chinese government, by the way. <laughs> um, but the fact that it came in immediately afterwards completely cut out not just 20 minutes, but, you know, you'd have to land, you'd have to safety the landings and all that stuff. You'd have to do complete checkouts. You'd have to make sure everything was okay. There would be all the suit up times. There would probably be a rest time that would happen multiple, multiple hours, you know, as much as 20, 24 hours before they would actually set foot on the surface. So they just kind of went ka-chunk and they just elided all of that stuff for the purposes of drama. And I thought that was rather unfortunate because I think it was dramatic enough for the fact that they landed and they could have, you know, just made it last longer. Clearly they were just like, no, 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 we have to have that picture. That's the way it's got to go. And so, eh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> but I did not appreciate that. It really kind of threw me out of the moment at the end of the whole season. And that was unfortunate. And finally, the questionable. So the weightlessness effects are sometimes a bit obviously wrong. The actors are clearly hanging on things in shots rather than actually weightless. But of course, we don't have a Tom Cruise budget here, so we can't fly to the ISS and actually have this done. So I'll forgive them. They really did try. They did the best they could under the circumstances to make it all pretty darn good. It was, it was you know, not bad. It's just once in a while you'd be like, wait, that person's clearly like just hanging on something, not actually weightless. But, but you know, they, they tried. Also questionable was the water crisis. I found it a little hard to believe because almost surely they would have two complete redundant systems. For something that critical, they would have two systems that were identical to each other with a bunch of spare parts also for the most likely things to break. So the fact that they had like a, a main system and then they had this weird backup system that didn't work as well, but it wasn't the same, but they could transfer some parts. Again, makes for good drama, but that was ridiculous. I was like, no engineers are going to build a craft that's going to have to withstand years of being away from the earth without a redundant water system. That would just be ridiculous. Also questionable was the entire landing sequence. As I mentioned before, I just found it a little bit odd that they would not have detached some sort of landing craft. That just would have made an awful lot more sense. Again, you know, I put it in the bad, but I could also put it in the questionable because it could be basically a starship that they were landing. And that is the way they're planning on doing it, although I think it's actually kind of nutty. But, <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, it could be the bad, it could be the questionable, but I'll just mention that in both places. And then there was the communication between Earth and Mars. It was a very weird thing. It was like they were talking on their cell phones and everything was cool and chill until they hit like almost to a second, a magical dividing line. And suddenly they were unable to communicate at all except via text messages with delays. That kind of doesn't make sense. If you look at even 2001, Stanley Kubrick's movie from 1968, you know, they have these delays and they can't real time communicate, but they can still send video files, you know, back and forth. So there's no real reason why they couldn't have sent audio files or video files or something like that and why it suddenly had to be text messages. I, again, you know, the title of the series is Away, so I'm sure part of the idea was the loneliness and the being away part. But it was kind of ridiculous that they couldn't communicate with each other via something more high bandwidth like video or, or you know, better audio quality or something like that. And it was just text messages. The delay, yes, absolutely. That's not a problem. Also, it kind of would have been like, you know, one of those things that would have happened over time, not some sort of magical, you you know, you like crossed a barrier and suddenly you're out of audio video range. That makes no real sense. It just should have been a longer and longer delay and longer to, to transmit high bandwidth stuff. Obviously, that does make sense that it would take longer to transmit high bandwidth things and that text would be preferred, but you could still send, you know, birthday greetings or something via FaceTime. <laughs> FaceTime. <laughs> space time. There we go. Instead of FaceTime, it's space time. Conclusions. So in terms of accuracy, it got so close to being just right that it's actually annoying that it was wrong where it was wrong or questionable where it was questionable. Obviously, consultants were used to ensure the accuracy, but also obviously there were times when they ignored the consultant's advice for the sake of narrative ease. Uh, as, a, as a writing teacher, as well as a scientist, I'm never about narrative ease. You should always go the real way there, right? If you've committed to doing something realistic, commit to it 100%. It's still going to work. You're just going to have to be more creative in the way that you solve your problems. And I think that's really cool. Creativity in solving problems narratively is a cool, cool thing. So it's a little bit unfortunate about the accuracy issues. Um, you know, scientifically accurate stuff can still be super, super dramatic and enjoyable to watch. 
and they wouldn't have needed to change very much to make it nearly perfectly accurate. But on the other hand, I still can't wait for season two. So what do you think? Did I get anything wrong about this? Did I miss something else that wasn't scientifically accurate or questionable? Definitely make sure you put your thoughts or comments in the comment section below, and we can have a conversation about that. That would be super cool. And in the meantime, definitely like and subscribe if you enjoyed this and want some more, and ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.